Good morning, and welcome to this Waypoint One briefing. War is broken out in Israel, and that brings us to a point. What should we as Christians be doing with what we're seeing and hearing in the news? <clears throat> What's God's heart for us as Christians as we watch this war unfold? Well, that's what we're talking about today. And although this is not a deep dive into any of this, I just want you to be aware of God's heart. One, for his people, Israel, and two, for his people, the church, as we come together in praise and worship of him. <clears throat> Psalm 122 tells us exactly what we should be doing. It's an order from God written by the psalmist David, King David. I'll pick up in verse 6. It says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who loves you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, Peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. The idea here that we pray for peace is inherent in what God has asked us to do. God has made a promise with the Israelite Hebrew people, a promise that they will always be and they will always be a nation forever, an eternal covenant made with Abraham. We as the church, as Christians, must come alongside them and pray for the peace of the holy city. Jesus will rule and reign for a thousand years from Jerusalem. And so we need to realize that this is God's heart. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now I mentioned that there is a forever covenant made with the Hebrew nation. That we start this idea back when Abraham was called, when the nation was created and a man named Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abram was in a Muslim nation called out of Ur of the Chaldees, which is kind of modern day Iraq. And he was brought into, God says, I want you to go to a place I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you a land. That land will become the Hebrew nation. You will be the father of a, of a nation. He says, when they come against you, I'll come against them, and you will be, you will be, uh, the, the families of the earth will be blessed. Well, what is the blessing that all families of all the earth have come out of the Hebrew nation? Well, that's easy, the salvation of Jesus Christ. This was the, this was the report, this was the plan that was put into process back in Genesis chapter 3 when God told, e, told, told the serpent, that he was going to, that there was going to be enmity between the seed of the virgin and his seed, and there was going to be a battle, and that man was going to crush his head. That's Jesus Christ coming out of the Hebrew nation. It was a promise made by Abraham. And later on in the chapter, we know that that promise is made, chapter 15. It says, verse 1 After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, "God, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, and Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. 
And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. He believed God, and he was seen as righteous that that's the whole start of the belief that we live by faith that the just shall live by faith he was justified by believing god verse 7 and then he said to him i am the lord who brought you out of the ur of the chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it and he said lord god how shall i know that i will inherit it and he's going to go through a a unilateral Um, making a unilateral covenant with Abraham. He says, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to have you set up these animals and we're going to cut them in two. And then I'm going to do what's needed to make a promise to you. You won't have to do anything. Realize my promise is eternal and binding and will never change. That's what's happening here. We'll skip forward to verse 13. And then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years, talking about Egypt. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. (laughs) That's Egypt. And now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, when behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenzanites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. God says, I have made a covenant. I'm going to give you this land of the covenant. You're going to go in and you're going to take the land. I'm going to hold the land for you forever. Now we know that the land was made desolate for a while in judgment because Israel didn't believe that Israel had some issues and God judged them. But in the Bible, it tells us that that God would bring them back after 70 years in captivity in Babylon, and then after another period of time after 70 AD, and when the nation was born again, May 14, 1948, just after the end of World War II, God made a promise that the, wor- that the nation would not be given over again. Now, we can see this promise made in a number of different places. One of the best ones is in Ezekiel. Now, after Gog and Magog war, Ezekiel 38 and 39, this is a prophetic war that has yet to occur. So when we see how God speaks about the nation of Israel here, we know that it's in the future, even from this day. This is what it says 39 verse 25 therefore thus says the lord god now i will bring back the captives of jacob and have mercy on the whole house of israel and i will be jealous for my holy name and after they have borne their shame and all their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me When they dwelt safely in their own land and no one made them afraid, when I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I have hallowed it to them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them any more for i shall have poured out my spirit on the house of israel says the lord god we see we get the idea here that if if after or at the end of a prophetic war that hasn't happened yet he's turning his eyes back to the people israel then israel is not done We're getting caught up into something called replacement theology. 
It's a theology that believes that there are, there, there are many who believe that God had turned his face away from the Israelite people and, and gave all of those eternal promises to the church. All of these Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant, all of those covenants made to Israel in the Old Testament have transferred to a new people, a people called the church. That is incorrect because the Bible tells us that at the end of the age, God will turn his eyes back to Israel. We see this idea in Romans chapter 11. Verse 25, it says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has come to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and will be turn and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's Israel. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. God talking about Israel. Verse 28, concerning the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, they are enemies for your sake. Now at this point, Israel doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's the whole point of the seven year tribulation, that when the rapture of the church happens and the church goes away the age of grace is over it comes to its fruition god as we see here in ezekiel 39 will turn his face back to the israelite people and in that seven year tribulation he will judge an unbelieving nation so it says here because of the gospel is an enemy for their sake but concerning the election the promises made the nation created through abraham the election they are beloved for the sake of the fathers it's a promise i've made it cannot change i will not revoke it it was a one-sided covenant and it says here verse 29 uh, 29 for the gifts and the calling of god are irrevocable for as you were once disobedient to God, yet they now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so those or these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. What he's saying here is, is he's saying, look, I've turned, I, I've put a blinders on Israel at the point, at the moment, so that I could turn my attention to Gentiles in the church age. I've taken care of the church. They will be raptured into heaven. I will turn my eyes back to the Jews and I will take that blinder off and they will realize that they made a mistake missing Jesus Christ. That I brought disobedience to everybody so that everybody could be saved by the gospel. God is so merciful to all people. And we know in Revelation that all peoples, all nations, all tongues, all ethnicities, all people will be represented in heaven. That's to say that all Gentiles, all Jews, all people, all nations, it doesn't matter. Why that's important is because you're, you're not dis, your salvation isn't determined by what country you live in or what religion you follow or what ethnicity or what promises or what holy books. All that matters is that you believe in Jesus Christ. There is now only two types of people, those who accept Jesus as his Savior and those who do not. And that's what we're talking about now. So, so as we get to this as we get to this place in Romans about the question, what should we be doing? We should be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. We should be praying for the peace of Israel because God's people are all people made in the image of God. And our hearts and minds must be for them. I love this Romans chapter 12, verse 9. This is, it says here in the heading, behave like a Christian. We have to let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor given preference to one another, not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints and given to hospitality. 
Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much depends on you. Live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This this is how we should be acting. One to ourself, one to those who we know, one to those who are like us, and two to the Jewish nation, to the Palestinian nation, to all people made in God's image because God wants all people to be saved. He is not willing to destroy. He takes no joy in destroying people. He wants all to come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ that he may save them for eternity in heaven. As you're watching these things happen, as you're watching this war go on, as you're watching the suffering, pray for the peace of Israel. They are our brethren in Christ. And live this life seeking peace in any way you can, loving people as Christ loved the church. This briefing is dismissed.